It's common these days for voters to feel frustrated, to feel as if legislators aren't paying attention to them. Whether it's the Flint water crisis in Michigan, or partisan polarization, or other ways in which legislators seem to not heed their constituents' opinions, legislative seats nationwide are less competitive than they used to be. And one big reason why is gerrymandering. Voters have chosen to arrange themselves in cities, in towns, in rural areas, and then legislators take that natural pattern and draw the lines as they like to suit themselves. A major problem is partisan gerrymandering, drawing a whole pattern of districts to suit one whole political party. Redistricting happens every 10 years. This leads to a situation in which close to 100 seats in Congress are less competitive than they would be otherwise. Intuitively, we think about gerrymandering as centering around weird shaped boundaries, right? Strangely shaped boundaries that are crooked, that have funny bumps and valleys and so on. It turns out that's not such a great way to define a gerrymander. Because voters tend to live in communities of like-mindedness, imagine a city that is mostly Democrats and imagine it surrounded by a community of voters who are mostly Republicans distributed over space. It is possible to creatively draw lines where we can pack the Democrats in one district, for instance, by drawing a boundary that encompasses most of the Democrats in a single, nicely, circularly shaped district, and then distributing the remaining Democrats over remaining districts so that the, in the end the Republicans get an overwhelming advantage. You can take the same map and do the opposite. You can take this nice cluster of voters in the center and now take wedges out of that center city and now create pie slices and the first bite of each pizza slice will then be just enough to make that slice a secure win for Democrats. Therefore, it's possible to draw lines to make it either running the table for Republicans or running the table for Democrats, depending on what legislators want. So what's left is to come up with some standard where gerrymandering can be defined uh, without reference to maps. And it turns out there's a tool available. The idea is to invoke the idea of partisan symmetry. If one side has 75, 80% of the vote in district after district, that side has been packed. When one side wins in landslides, but the other side's wins are closer, the question arises, did this overall pattern occur incidentally, as if by chance or by nonpartisan means? If not, then we would conclude that one side's voters were packed more than the others, as if on purpose. It turns out that this is the easiest thing that you can test. In all the sciences and all of engineering, the most widely used test is something called student's t-test. And it was made possible by this guy, William Gossett. Gossett lived uh, in the early 20th century. He was chief experimental brewer of the Guinness Company in Ireland. And Gossett had this problem of how to tell whether hops quality was good. And he was very pleased about this. And he said, okay, uh, I would like to publish this. And his lab notebook said, student's laboratory notebook. And he had a bit of a sense of humor and he said, oh, I'm student. And so to this day, it's called student's t-test. The t-test compares two averages. Here the two averages are of the winning vote share in Democratic districts and the winning vote share in Republican districts. The t-test asks whether two averages are different enough that they are unlikely to have arisen incidentally from nonpartisan mechanisms. For example, redistrictors want to draw straight-ish boundaries. They want to honor communities of interest. They want to follow other rules that are set down in law. And for those reasons, averages can sometimes be a little bit different, advantaging one side or the other side. What the t-test asks is, is that difference so large that it could not have arisen incidentally? And if that's the case, then what we have is a likely gerrymander. A great example of partisan asymmetry that can be detected using the t-test is North Carolina. 2010 was a wave election for the Republicans. And with their new control over the redistricting process, they created an advantage for themselves. It was a perfect inversion of what had happened previously. Democrats ended up with four congressional districts and Republicans ended up with nine congressional districts, despite the fact that Democratic candidates won more votes that year. This pattern was repeated in 2014 and 2016. And in each case, the vote was reasonably closely split. But in each case, the Democrats won more lopsided wins. And the t-test tells us that these, this difference between Democratic wins and Republican wins could not have arisen by chance. There's overwhelming public opinion against gerrymandering and a general sense that it ought to be addressed. And there are two ways. One is through courts and the other is by activists. Courts could say, we will define gerrymandering as violation of partisan symmetry. Are the two parties being treated fairly and equally? And if they're not, 
then there's partisan asymmetry. And the Supreme Court has expressed some willingness to do that. Another route is for activists. Voters have started to pass fair districting laws. The risk is that they may leave loopholes by not thinking ahead and realizing that in fact there's still the possibility of partisan asymmetry. So writing into the law something like a simple statistical test, like the t-test, would close that last loophole. Here's an opportunity to make the democratic process work a little bit better. If this effort succeeds, what we're going to end up with is the situation that the founders envisioned. The voters pick their legislators and not the other way around.